The title of our sermon this morning is Grant Us Boldness, and this is part two in this text, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. So as we come to this text, we return this morning to our study of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And we've come now to the end of Paul's opening prologue, wherein Paul now turns our attention to his great theme, the great theme of this letter, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, last Lord's Day we made note of the unique way in which Paul determined to make this transition to his subject, this transition to his theme. He wraps up a general introduction of his plans and purposes concerning them, this church at Rome. He has had a, a great desire to visit them. He'd often planned to come to them, but has been hindered to this point. He wants to bear fruit among them, wants to encourage them, wants to establish them in the faith. And for that reason, he says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Now, what's unique about the transition is the way in which Paul decides to communicate the readiness or the reason for his readiness. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you because I'm not ashamed of it, right? He could have said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you because I'm, I have every confidence in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach the gospel in Rome to you because I rejoice in the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation, right? I want to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome because I believe in the gospel, but Paul doesn't word his transition in that way. He says, I'm not ashamed of it. All of those reasons would certainly have been true of the Apostle Paul. But no, it's because Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. By stating his assertion in this way, Paul implies an obvious temptation. Many are ashamed of the gospel. Many professing Christians in Rome in the days of the Apostle Paul and many professing Christians in our own version of Rome in the midst of our crooked and perverse generation and today act as though they are ashamed of the gospel. And why would that be? Well, the gospel exposes sin. The gospel pronounces guilt. The gospel confronts the condemned, convicts the believer, the unbeliever. The gospel reveals the wrath of God against sinful man. The gospel condemns human pride. The gospel charges all under sin. The gospel exposes the sham of human goodness as worthless and defiled and polluted and corrupt. We are the cause of all the problems in the world, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. The gospel would communicate that we are deceitful, our hearts deceitful and desperately wicked. We've all turned aside. We've all together become worthless. The gospel pronounces of men that their throat is an open tomb. Our tongues spread lies. Poison is under our lips. Cursing and bitterness is in our mouths. For all our self-professed wisdom, we are a pack of fools. That's what the gospel communicates, doesn't it? This is what the Bible says, and this is not a popular message. Those who love their sin, those who love to live life for themselves, hate this message. And so they heap shame upon the message, and they heap shame upon the messenger. Well, following the example of his Lord before him, Paul counted that shame a, a small thing, and Paul bore the marks of that shame in his back he never wavered from his course. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. At the end of his life, we catch a glimpse as to why he may have stated his assertion this way to this particular church at Rome. Paul would eventually be imprisoned there. He finally gets to visit, but when he does, it's under the watchful eye of the Roman government as a prisoner under house arrest. And Paul knows that his death is, is at hand. He's going to be executed for preaching the gospel. He's going to be executed for faithfulness to this gospel that he's not ashamed to preach. And so he writes to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, 
for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So he tells Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He's departed for Thessalonica. Crescens has departed for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. In Rome, at the end, only Luke is with me. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. And Paul's words there, alone at the end, reminiscent of the Lord's words at the cross. This world heaping shame upon Jesus Christ at the cross as they murder him without cause. The rulers sneered. He saved others. Let him save himself. The soldiers mocked. If you're king of the Jews, then save yourself. Criminals on either side of him blasphemed. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And Luke records all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. The disciples had all fled. Peter had denied him three times, following him now at a distance. Isaiah had said of him that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. In other words, we were ashamed of him. So whether it's the, the love of this world that Demas preferred or the fear of man that have kept many from standing with Paul at the hour of his need or the despised visage of a crucified savior, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. Many, many have made shipwreck of their faith ashamed of the gospel. The Lord says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. So listen, brothers and sisters, if we're going to face this temptation to be ashamed of the gospel, if we are going to stand with the apostle Paul and make the same assertion that he does, if you will stand with Paul and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, then you better have good reason to support that position. You better have good reason. Your, your reason had better be clear and well-defined. It better be reason that flows from DNA-level DNA heart convictions that you are willing to die for. What reason would have compelled Peter who denied the Lord? What reason would have compelled the other disciples who had fled at his arrest? They all fled the Lord Jesus Christ. What would have compelled them to preach the gospel boldly to their own deaths? What would have compelled them to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? What reason compelled Paul? For or because the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's the reason that Paul gives. Now, what a great answer. That is a tremendous answer. If we think for a moment, meditate on that answer, all that that answer entails, all the implications of that answer, that answer will serve well to motivate you and I to take the same stand. For you and I not to be ashamed of the gospel. For you and I to stand as Paul in the face of temptation and to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And we want to lay hold of that truth this morning. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. Notice three facts with me about the gospel from Paul's statement in verse 16. One, the purpose of the gospel. Two, the people of the gospel. Three, the power of the gospel. The purpose, the people, and the power. First, consider with me the purpose of the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation. The purpose of the gospel is salvation. The gospel is good news. The gospel is glad tidings concerning salvation. The gospel is is a message of salvation. We cannot be ashamed of this message. It is a message of salvation. (laughs) It is a message of salvation. Now, the word salvation presupposes damnation. That's why it is incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, not to be ashamed of this message. This is a message of salvation. That message presupposes damnation. The Greek word translated salvation in verse 16 refers to being delivered from harm. Literally, to be snatched by force from some peril or danger. That's what it's referring to, that word salvation. In this case, we know what the harm is. We know what the danger is. Paul tells us in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You know, men suppose God to be this frail, old, grandfather-like figure, smells like Old Spice, keeps a butterscotch in his pocket, (laughs) wouldn't harm a fly. But that's not the God of the Bible. Those apart from Jesus Christ are in real peril. If you are here this morning and you've not turned from your sin to put faith in Jesus Christ alone, you're in peril. You are in danger. You are under the threat of certain harm. When the God of the Bible is a consuming fire who will devour his adversaries. God is the one who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay God is the one who flooded the earth and killed every living thing but eight souls on the ark, the animals who were with them. God is the one who rained down fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And this word salvation from verse 16 pictures those angels in Genesis chapter 19 taking Lot and his family forcibly by hand, dragging them out of the city and say, flee for your life. That's what salvation is. Salvation carries the sense of God's people safe behind blood-stained doorways as the angel of death strikes down the firstborn in the house of Egypt. Apart from salvation, Jonathan Edwards well described the danger that you are in. He said, the God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you. It is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. Salvation, listen, salvation is deliverance from harm. Salvation is deliverance from danger. Particularly, it's deliverance from the harm that God himself intends against you in hell as judgment against your sin. You have sinned against a holy God. You have offended him with your rebellion. That word salvation encompasses all that is necessary to redeem you and to reconcile you to God, to restore you into a right relationship with the one that you've offended, with the one who, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, holds out an offer to rescue you from the danger that you're in through rebellion in your sin. Our understanding of the term, that term salvation, should first include a five-fold deliverance from sin. Salvation would include a five-fold deliverance from sin. First, through salvation, we're delivered from the guilt of sin. All men are born under a state of condemnation. And David said, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Listen, we are born under the law. And being born under the law, we're born under the condemnation of the law. We are born under a sentence of death. The proof of that is that every man dies. (laughs) That's not just some arbitrary event that takes place at the end of life. Men die because of sin. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And through salvation, we are delivered from the guilt of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Second, through salvation, we are delivered from the power of sin. Our trouble isn't merely that we are guilty of sin. We are enslaved to sin. Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 8, verse 34, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And brothers and sisters, that's because our natures, apart from Jesus Christ, apart from a new creation, apart from the spirit of God causing us to be born again, we are by nature children of wrath, by nature sons and daughters of disobedience, by nature of our fathers, the devil. And someone says, I have free will. Yes, you are free to sin in any number of ways in keeping with your own depraved nature. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? We're just exchanging one form of slavery for another. Having been set free from sin in salvation, Paul says, by the grace of God, we become slaves of righteousness. Third, we are delivered from the pollution of sin from the corruption that is the effect of sin in your life. Peter says that through exceedingly great and precious promises, we are made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But not merely or only in the world does that corruption exist. Paul describes this corruption as another principle within our own members. It lies within our own flesh. Romans chapter seven, verse 21. Paul says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see this other law, this other principle in my members that wars against the law of my mind and brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. You ever thought that way before? Your own inward corruption, your own inward pollution, the remaining effects and consequences and perversions of sin within our own flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who sets us free from that pollution salvation must deal with the corruption of our very natures that we are depraved. Fourth, we are being gradually delivered from the presence of sin. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 explains that through one offering, Jesus Christ has perfected forever those who are being, that word is present, active, it's ongoing, being sanctified. Jesus Christ has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In other words, further and further and further, more and more progressively set apart to holiness through a present ongoing work of the Spirit of God. And one day that will come to a glorious end when we ourselves will be glorified. Not merely, as we've talked about before, not merely passe non peccare, or able not to sin, but brothers and sisters, we will be non passe peccari, not able to sin, praise God. Salvation must fully, must finally, and will eventually deal with the presence of sin altogether in the life of a believer, in the life of one who is his and finally, salvation must deliver us from the penalty of sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, we have our fruit to holiness. And to the end, what is it? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Fully and finally delivered from the penalty of sin.
thinking of salvation. That word salvation in these terms also hi highlights salvation, doesn't it? As a past, present, and future reality, right? Thinking of salvation, that term and all that it entails, also involves for us salvation as a past, present, and future reality. Many people, when they think of salvation, I did growing up, often think of it as a single one-time occurrence when ordinarily you did something in the past and now based upon your so-called sincerity in doing whatever that thing was, you're now saved with no further concern for anything else in the future, right? And a lot of times they will tell you, if you doubt your salvation, go back and look at the date. Go back and look at what you did. Boy, where's your faith when you do that, right? It's not in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved, past, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is an aspect of salvation that is past, never to re be repeated, never to be undone. And Paul says, having been justified by faith, that's an aorist passive, for folks who are considering Greek, it's a snapshot of an event that took place in the past and now has ongoing implications in the present and in the future, but it took place in the past. Paul says, having been justified by faith, we have now peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see past occurrence, having been justified, current realities, peace with God. Do you see? We have been forgiven of all our sin, our sin imputed to Jesus Christ. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed or credited, given to us as a free gift of God's grace. And we are declared to be righteous. We are reconciled to God. We are adopted into the household of God and we, present tense, have eternal life. And now you and I rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen? There's an aspect of our salvation that is past, never to be repeated, never to be undone. Those who are saved by Jesus Christ continue to experience salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are present, active, perishing, but to us who are being saved, present, passive, it is the power of God. Notice it is not the power of man. <laughs> to those of you who are saving yourselves by turning to Christ in faith or walking an aisle or saying a prayer or taking the mass or whatever it is, this mindless, ritual, heartless thing you do, no, it doesn't say that. But to us who are being saved, it's called the divine passive for a reason. It's a divine passive because God is the one who is working in power to bring it about, right? To us who are being saved, present passive, it is the power of God. Salvation in this sense is an ongoing present process as much as it is a past reality. We are those being sanctified while we are being preserved by God to the end. Sanctification and perseverance. We aren't fully separated from sin yet, are we? There's work left to be done in us, isn't there? A lot. Our old man has been crucified. That's true. We have become, as Paul would say, a new lump. That's true. But now we must purge out the old leaven. Now we must put on the new man, renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, praise God, Paul says, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now, if you're used to thinking about salvation in terms of only a past tense occurrence at some point in your life, and that statement of Paul makes absolutely no sense. How is it that our salvation is nearer than when we first believed? Praise God, it's nearer. <laughs> Those who have been saved by grace through faith in the past, those who are being saved through sanctification by the Spirit in the present, will one day certainly experience a fully consummated and final salvation in the future. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. 
much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Future passive, passive again, shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled past, we shall be saved future by his life. Do you see? Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I thought we were already adopted. I thought we were already redeemed. Inaugurated, yes. Redeemed, yes. Adopted, yes. The fullness of that still awaits. For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? In other words, we don't have the fullness of it yet. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. If this is your best life now, then what hope do you have? (laughs) Where is your hope? We hope for something greater. We hope for what we do not see, and so we wait eagerly for it with perseverance. Jude Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now notice all aspects of salvation, that word, past present and future are described using the passive voice. Described using the passive voice. That doesn't negate the necessity of working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, does it? Doesn't render those commands of scripture useless or hypothetical or unnecessary but it does communicate that even as we do that, even as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, It is God who is the one who is at work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Our salvation, past, present, future, is all a work of grace. God is the one who saves. That doesn't negate our laboring, our striving, our running, our working. That doesn't negate the means that God uses to bring about that sanctification, that perseverance but it does not negate the fact that God is the one who saves. Furthermore, notice it's not only that we are saved from harm or that we are saved from danger, from sin, from the wrath of God. Note with me what we are saved to. We are reconciled to God. We are saved to eternal life. We are delivered to a glorious hope to the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Herein lies the purpose of the gospel. Salvation is a five-fold deliverance. Salvation is a three-tenths reality. Salvation, which is all of grace, the work of God, reconciling sinners to himself in love and in joy and in hope. That's what Paul has in mind here when he says that he is not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God to salvation. To you, the gospel was a message of this salvation, a glorious hope, a glorious joy, an almost unspeakable, unimaginable gift forgiveness of all your sin and reconciliation with God, peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to do anything but believe upon him who gave himself for me. Yes, believe upon him and be saved. What a gift. What a tremendous message. And there are people perishing continuously without it. It is the power of God to salvation. 
It is the gospel that was the power of God for our salvation. It is the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. It is the gospel that will be the power of God for our salvation. So you and I must place ourselves continually under the preaching of the gospel. Remember, Paul is ready to preach the gospel to this church in Rome where there are already believers. Certainly Paul's going to preach the gospel to the lost. But Paul's ready to preach the gospel to this church in Rome. Beloved of God, called to be saints. Those whom Paul has said have been justified through faith, past tense. So you you and I, we've noted the, the purpose of the gospel. Note then with me the people to whom the power of God in the gospel is directed. Note with me the people. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek Literally, verse 16, for everyone who is believing, present tense. Oh, we're thinking a lot this morning already of these tenses and the grammar of these verses, these clauses, and that's important. It is literally for everyone who is, present tense, ongoing, believing. In other words, the gospel not only serves as the means through which God initially brings salvation, But the gospel is also the means through which God works in power to continue their salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and perseverance in the faith. The gospel is not only for the lost. In other words, the gospel is also for believers, those who are, present tense, believing. The gospel is not only that means by which the Lord saves us, The gospel is also that means through which he continues to nourish our faith, sustain our faith, encourage our faith, mature our faith, preserve our faith, strengthen our faith, through which God grows us in our knowledge and apprehension of the fullness of the blessedness that is eternally ours through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Many Christians have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ in response to the gospel. And then those same Christians begin to live as though the Christian life is then sustained through works of the law or that favor with God is somehow merited favor given by or through works of the law that somehow having been justified freely by his grace, the ongoing reality of his favor in my life may only be maintained by my works or by my performance. Now certainly, think with me now, certainly we would understand the law to be a rule of life for the Christian. Our confession says as much. Our confession describes it as a means through which we are to know and obey the will of God. And that is important for the Christian. It is a means, the law is a means through which we may examine ourselves, grow in our conviction against sin, grow in our hatred towards sin. It's through the law that we, we cultivate a clearer sight, a clearer understanding of our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. The law is helpful, useful to restrain our sin. The law is helpful, useful to convict us of sin. The law warns us of the consequences of our sin. The law in that sense is a means through which God may work to preserve us in the faith and keep us from the path to apostasy. But the law can never again condemn us of sin. Never. Faced again with the law's demands, we are no longer to subject ourselves to the judgment of the law. We're no longer to put ourselves back under the condemnation of the law. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation. The gospel is that means through which God applies the blessings and benefits of the person and work of Jesus Christ by his spirit to preserve us in the faith, to mature us in the faith, to grow us in the faith, and to keep us to the end. The gospel, we're to live in light of the gospel. We are to flee to Christ through the gospel, not 
cower under the condemnation of the law. When there is therefore now no condemnation anymore for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul asked the Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I am not to imagine for a moment. I am not to imagine for a moment that favor with God is somehow earned or merited by my performance. Having been justified by faith past tense, I have present tense peace with God through Jesus Christ. And I am to continuously remember that present tense through the gospel. It's through those blessed realities expressed in the gospel that we are more than conquerors. Again, um, guilt under the law is an awful motivator. There's no power in the law to purify us one speck. There's no power in the law to transform you one bit. The power is in the gospel. Do you see? There's no power in the law that it can afford us one ounce of victory over sin. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. There is no power in the law that can afford us one ounce of peace and affliction. It is the gospel that is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. There's no power in the law that can make us holy. True holiness flows from faith in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Adherence to the law is not legalism. But that law has no power to transform. We know that this is the right way to think and speak, right? Most who have grown up under the preaching of the gospel, an accurate gospel, a sound biblical church, would affirm that that is the right way to think and to speak. But sometimes there is, in the life of the Christian, a disconnect in applying what we say we rightly understand. <laughs> when it comes to application, it can be difficult. And those truths can be muddied as we, uh, under the conviction of our own sin, begin to inch ourselves back underneath the condemnation that we've been set free from. What you'll see in a Christian or in a church with a wrong view of the law what you will see in a Christian or in a church that seeks to place themselves or the people back under the condemnation of law is a legal temper. A legal temper. You'll see self-righteousness. You will see spiritual pride. Or on the other hand, you'll see morbid introspection, navel-gazing, <laughs> insecurity, hopelessness, lack of assurance, spiritual depression. These are fearful and dangerous ditches on either side of gospel truth. If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, not then with him, freely give to us all things? Do you believe it? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? This is the gospel, do you see? This is what we're to lay hold of. This is what we're to apprehend. This is how we conquer. We conquer in the power of his spirit. In the blessedness of what Jesus Christ has already accomplished, we labor and fight and strive in this power. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. For your sake, Paul says, we're killed all day long. We're accounted for sheep as the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's the motivation, right? For I am persuaded 
Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. Do you see? What an awesome reason. We'll see all that working through the text of Romans. In this, everyone who is believing in this, Paul didn't have one gospel for Jews and another gospel for Gentiles. Paul had one gospel, and it is the power of God through which men are saved in believing. The gospel is for the Jew first, in one sense. It's the Jew first chronologically. Lord told the woman at the well in Samaria that salvation was of the Jews. It started with the Jews, right? God worked through Abraham and Abraham's seed. So when the apostles were sent out, they were sent first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and then to the Gentiles. You see that pattern in Paul's own ministry. They were to begin in Jerusalem and Judea and then on to Samaria and the uttermost ends of the earth. So historically, chronologically, Salvation was to the Jew first. It was, also, it was also because the Jews were in as much need of the gospel as anyone else. <laughs> we're going to see that through the rest of chapter 1, into chapter 2, and into chapter 3. So the next couple of years, we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's going to make that point very clear, very clear. There's no one outside the scope of the gospel. Praise God. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone. Everyone. Everyone who believes. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because of its purpose. It is the power of God to salvation. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because of, of the people that it's for. It's for everyone who is believing. For the Jew first and also for the Greek and Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation. The gospel isn't merely a word about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It isn't merely a statement or a message about the power of God to save those who believe. The gospel, Paul says, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, there are two subtle nuances that I would like for us to draw from this simple statement. First, the gospel is God's power. It is the power of God through which God works in his power to save. In other words, not man's power. <laughs> in other words, the gospel is not what God tells us to do so that we may turn and work in our own power to save ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil? That is the death knell of Arminianism. And yet, people miss that simple fact. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot transform ourselves. We cannot change our spots. We cannot change our skin. We cannot change our nature. We are powerless to overcome our own sinful proclivities, our own sinful nature. Self-help may correct temporal habits, but it cannot change the human heart. You can go to a 12-step program and be set free, so to speak, may, you may think, from some habit that you've sinned your way into, but it does nothing to change your nature. And frankly, professing churches all over the place that try to replicate that worldly wisdom making it somehow under the guise of biblical wisdom? No. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. The gospel is what transforms the human heart. 
that which the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to our flesh, but according to the Spirit. Salvation will not come through man's wisdom. Salvation will not come through human arguments, worldly philosophy, manipulation, coercion, persuasion, reason, ingenuity. Now, there is a place for persuasion and pleading and the preaching of God's word, but that in and of itself has no power. The power is in the gospel to save, and God uses means. The gospel is God's power. And the Simon Maguses of the world, the Simon Maguses of the evangelical world cannot seize it for themselves and wield it themselves, stir it up for themselves like many try to do, right? That's the, that's the whole point behind this manipulative approach to worship, this manipulative approach to the culture, right? M trying to manipulate them. And, you know, I... I <laughs> I knew a guy once, shortly after I converted, met this scoundrel who used to say, give me five minutes alone with somebody and I'll get you a convert for Christ. Right? He had sat down, worked out his presentation to such a degree, followed it to, in his own mind, followed it to perfection such that you would be stupid if you said no, right? Manipulation, manipulation, manipulation. He claimed it was the power of God. Unbelievable. And listen, that is the, the testimony of many a professing church. The gospel is God's power through which he works in his power to save. Secondly, the gospel is God's power <laughs> to salvation. Inherent to the gospel message, inherent to it, is the power of an omnipotent God. That power alone is sufficient to save the chief of sinners, sufficient to transform and humble the hardest of human hearts. Think for a moment with me about the power of God on display in our salvation. If you are saved, God called you to himself in power. If you're saved, God called you to himself in his power. It was an effectual call, an efficacious call. It was a wonder working call. It accomplished the purpose for which God intended it. When in your intransigence, when in your obstinance, you stubbornly resisted all your life, when God called you by his spirit, you turned to faith in Jesus Christ. You couldn't resist any longer, could you? <laughs> because Christ was to you now precious. <laughs> it was in power, in power that God caused you to be born again. It was in power that your life was changed. It was in power that you became a new creation in Christ. And now, whom having not seen, you love. Though you, now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why? The power of the living God at work on and in you. It is that same power at work in and through you now that is sanctifying you conforming you to the perfect image of his son. It is that same power at work enabling you, empowering you to obey. Have you thought of yourself, considered your experience in those terms? When all of those years you were fruitless and hopeless and wallowing in your sin, and for God to come in power and to change your wicked heart, for God to come in power and to change your wicked affections and to change your wicked desires, and to transform them into Christ-exalting, Christ-loving desires and affections, right? Amazing. He just changed you, transformed you, and now you continue to be changed, continue to be transformed. 
sometimes not at the pace that you and I would like to see. <laughs> Our inward corruption, a devilish thing. But the Lord at work in us. It is that same power by which God now has preserved you all this time in the faith. Why is it that you are still persevering in the faith and have not as yet turned back to your sin? Because it is God who in power is preserving you. Don't turn back. (laughs) Don't turn back having put your hand to the plow. Such a one is not fit for the kingdom. But God is the one who preserves us. You are held by God's power. And it will be by the power of God that you are glorified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power with which God will raise us up. Now we know and we understand the power of God at work in our salvation because his power is effective. It is accomplishing an actual work. This is not for a moment, right? The genuine Christian cannot, would not say that this is some imaginary fiction. You are a new creation if you're in Christ. God is at work. And you can see the effects of it. It is effectual. It is efficacious. We see the efficacious. We see the fruits. The gospel, quote unquote, without being pragmatic, works. (laughs) Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. (laughs) And because it is by God's power, it is certain. (laughs) It will end in glorification. It will end. Having begun the work, God will complete the work. It will end in glorification. Martin Lloyd-Jones describes it as a prescription, right? The power of God in the gospel. He uses the analogy of someone with a terminal condition going to the doctor. Uh, This doctor has the cure, willing to give him the cure, hands him a prescription. And the words of that prescription are powerful because he will submit that prescription and be healed of his malady, right? The gospel is the prescription through which God works in power to do what God intends through the gospel, which is to save your wretched soul, save my wretched soul. It is efficacious. I mean, many times uh, over the years in preaching the gospel to people where in having the conversation with them, They are somehow imagining, right, that simple mental assent, simple agreement with a set of facts is the basis on which they're saved. And many times in professing churches, that's the manner in which they present the gospel. If you agree with these facts, then ask Jesus into your heart, you're saved, don't ever doubt it, right? A, B, C, with no life transformation, no R for repentance, no born again, none of that. Just admit you're a sinner, believe these facts, confess Jesus Christ, and you're you're saved. And then when you talk to them about what is this transformative work of the power of God in the life of a genuine believer, you are explaining color to a blind person, right? Absolutely no understanding whatsoever of those things. I remember standing on the driveway with a guy one time, and uh, he was about to, professing Christian, and I was on the verge of a divorce with his wife. And um, he said that um, there's no way, it was because of sexual immorality, and there was no way that he could control himself. I'm like, yeah, you're exactly right. There's no way that you can control yourself. The power is not in your flesh to do so. The power is in the gospel. You profess the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet in your acts, in your works, you deny him. Do you see? The gospel is the power of God to salvation. It is efficacious in the life of everyone who is believing. Well, that's the reason that Paul gives Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek.
That reason, the reason why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ can only be given with respect to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You notice that? That cannot be said of anything else. There is nothing else that can be claimed to be the power of God to salvation. The cults do not have it. Roman Catholicism does not have it. Islam does not have it. Buddha never saw it, right? It is in nothing else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is unique to the gospel alone. Frankly, any other reason could be easily and is easily counterfeited. Counterfeited. We were witnessing to a guy one time. He was saved because he had spoken in tongues. I know the Lord is with me. I know the Spirit is with me because I spoke in tongues. Hindus speak in tongues. What are we going to say about Hindus who do not believe in Jesus Christ? Right? Any other reason can be counterfeited. I feel that God is with me. He's always been with me. Your feelings are fickle, counterfeited, fleeting, fluctuating with every circumstance. Any other reason can be counterfeited. Any other reason that begins or ends with us cannot be the reason on which you base your convictions in the gospel. You cannot say simply, because of my experience, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what happens when you misinterpret your experience? What happens when the sometimes waning and fleeting highs that accompany that experience are no longer highs. <laughs> Any number of worldly philosophies have employed, been employed, uh, attempted to have been employed with the same effect. People have said, because of the gospel, I'm happier. I have more joy in my life. Is that the reason that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What happens when your joy evaporates in the heat of affliction? What happens when you're faced with real suffering? Brothers and sisters, what happens? What happens if that's your reason, if that's your basis for stating, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, then what happens when this world comes pounding on the door of our church the way the lost pounded on the door in the city of Sodom, uh, Sodom right? What happens when that persecution comes? Is that philosophy going to be the strength on which you lean? Or is it because the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes? God at work in power through the gospel to save sinners to himself. Is that going to be the reason? I remember witnessing to a lady one time, and she said, I just, I, you know, really like what you're saying. That all makes complete sense to me. I'm going to go back and talk to my priest about that. He's such a nice guy. <laughs> People today, professing Christians, professing Christians, placate a guilty conscience, placate their sense of need with all kinds of snake oils and cotton candies. But only the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation. Because it is the power of God to salvation, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. All of the reasons can be counterfeited. Our reason on which we are to base our convictions must be unique, must be distinctive to the gospel itself must be only something that a born-again recipient of wonder-working grace could say. One who has been given a new nature. One who has been created anew. And one who would say that God has done it all. Uh, let's root our reason, as Paul does, in that truth. What they believed, what they experienced... They became eyewitnesses of these things. It was that truth that compelled those formerly fleeing disciples, 
back into the city that crucified their Savior to preach the gospel themselves to their own death. It is the same compelling reason that constrained Paul to preach the gospel, to be, to be determined to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. They all became bold proclaimers of the gospel for this reason. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. God, please grant us that same boldness as we stand unashamed in proclamation of his gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We stand in awe of you. We magnify your name uh, because of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that that gospel treasure uh, has been given to us and through which you have worked in power to redeem us, to reconcile us, to transform us, to sanctify us, to grow us, to mature us, and to give us a hope and a certain inheritance. We thank you for that truth. We also thank you, Lord, that you have deposited that great, great treasure with earthen vessels now privileged with the blessing of standing with the Apostle Paul and saying, I'm not ashamed, and preaching this gospel with boldness, knowing that through the gospel you intend to build your church and to save sinners. I pray that we would go out in faith, Lord, in that certain truth, that we would go out in the strength that your Spirit supplies and that we would be faithful to you in the proclamation of this good word. Help us as we do. And I pray, God, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the encouragement of your saints, that you would give us much fruit for your name. We thank you for this and pray it in Christ's name. Amen. 